joined today by the Secretary of Labor and Regulation, Marsha Holtman, and also the Secretary of Health, Kim Malsam Risden. I'm gonna turn it over to Marsha in a little bit, but I wanted to touch on a couple things before I did so. Uh, I had a phone call a little while ago with the President, talked to him extensively about uh, some of the packages that moved through Congress uh, and some of the funding that would come to South Dakota about some flexibility that we might need to meet state budget needs. And then he also got the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, on the line, and we had a discussion on how that would work uh, coming forward. So I appreciated their time and their effort making sure that South Dakotans were treated uh, fairly and that we had language that worked to help meet our needs throughout the spread of this virus. I also talked this morning with the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, about our pork producers and about getting our plants back online here in South Dakota and then follow that up with a conference call with Smithfield. And we're hopeful that soon in a matter of days that we could start to see some activities back in that plant that adequately protects the employees, but also make sure that our nation's food supply is working and flowing smoothly as well. Just a few minutes ago, I signed an executive order that will give us some flexibility in uh, doing basic business of state government and for the folks across the state, this will include some flexibility on titling vehicles, mobile homes, semi-trailers as well. The details will be on covid.sd.gov, uh, and if you're curious about what all is built into that executive order, it can be found there. I wanna remind everybody as well too to continue to download the app, uh, CARE19. You can find that in the App Store, or you would be able to make sure that you can access it on the covid.sd.gov website as well. So if you're having difficulty with the App Store, do that. But this is the app that allows us to really streamline and build efficiencies into our contact tracing that we're using at the state and the Department of Health. So if you would encourage folks to do that, that would be great. With that, I'll turn it over to Marsha. Thank you, Governor. As is traditional, we release our new claim numbers each week, and so we did that this morning. And we did release a number for the week ending on April 25th of 5,389 new initial claims filed for unemployment insurance benefits. And I'd just like to share that this number is consistent with what I anticipated. Um, we would have probably seen a decline, but for the first time last week, we were able to take those PUA claims or the pandemic unemployment assistant claims for independent contractors, small business owners, et cetera. And so there was some pent up demand there. They were able to file and we're seeing that reflected in our numbers. So it doesn't necessarily reflect newly laid off workers, but rather those that were waiting until the appropriate time to file. So again, that number was 5,389 initial claims for last week. We have seen a six week total of 32,295 initial claims. And just to give you a point of reference, a typical six week time span for this time of year would usually be about 1,140 new claims. So we see that large percentage increase in our claim numbers. But this week, as things continue to change, I am happy to say when I have first announced that we would start taking those PUA claims for the independent contractors and such, we started that on April 17th. At the time, I anticipated that it would take us four weeks before we would start to process those claims and pay those claims. And I'm happy to say that as of yesterday, we started to pay some of those claims. We'll continue to do that today and tomorrow. And that's two weeks ahead of schedule. So some good news there for some folks that have been waiting for those uh, to begin payments. The other thing that is changing, uh, has been new to us this week, is as a result of the governor's plan to uh, the Road to Recovery Plan, and with many businesses receiving their PPP loans, they're starting to call individuals back to work. And so I just really wanna caution individuals that it is a personal choice to return to work, but there could be an impact to your eligibility for unemployment insurance benefits. So just make sure that you're um, weighing that carefully and knowing what your responsibilities are. Workers who have been placed on temporary layoff related to COVID-19 but refuse to return to work when recalled by their employer will lose their unemployment insurance benefits. There are some exceptions to that statement. Uh, for instance, if you have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or if a family member in your care has been diagnosed with COVID-19, 
um, if a member of the household has been diagnosed. So again, there's a complete list on our website of those different conditions, but we just really want to make sure that individuals realize that um, if you're not comfortable, if you're a little bit nervous about returning to work, that is not a valid reason to refuse to return to work as far as unemployment insurance is considered. So please make sure you're talking to your employer um, if the CDC guidelines are being followed and your employer is taking those precautions, that's really the best thing for everybody involved. So again, I just wanted to mention that. I don't want anybody inadvertently to do something wrong with their claim that puts them in a position in the future where they might have to repay those benefits um, that they were not eligible for. Let's open it up to any questions you may have. Any questions on the phone line? Yes, uh, Governor, um, this is Kelly Bowles of Kello TV. Sure, go ahead, Kelly. Um, so um, we were informed that your office was sent an email this morning by um, a group of organizations and people um, asking if you would meet with um, advocates for communities of color and Smithfield workers. I'm wondering if you've seen the letter and if that's a meeting you'd be open to. Yeah, we just received the letter and uh, was just discussing it, walking it over here to the press conference. So we will certainly be um, following up with them and seeing what we can facilitate. If I could ask a follow-up. Sure. One of, the, one of the questions was if the, the South Dakota Department of Health can enforce um, the CDC recommendations and penalize Smithfield for not following those recommendations. Uh, is that something that you can give the Department of Health authority to do? Well, we're having some conversations about what the executive order that the president just signed a couple days ago and how what that means as far as the CDC requirements and OSHA requirements in regards to the facilities. So uh, we don't have a lot of specifics to that. I can let Kim speak to what we understand so far, but we are doing some research into the Defense Protection Act, Production Act and seeing what that means in light of the executive order that came out of the administration. So this is Kim Olson Rice, and in addition to um, looking at the executive order that was just uh, released, I just want to point out that the CDC guidance um, around some of the workplace protections were um, really um, scripted as, as recommendations and considerations. And so even by the CDC standards, they were not considered requirements. And so uh, we will continue to work with Smithfield and other employers on doing what makes sense for them to keep their workers safe and um, you know make sure that they have uh, the equipment that they need to stay safe from COVID. Thank you. Further questions? Okay. All right. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you.